Welcome back to Missing. I am Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I'm doing fantastic today, Tim, because we just finished up a conversation that people are going to hear with an old friend, somebody who we had to reunite with on these airwaves because they have released a book on a story that is very near and dear to us. But before we get to that, Tim, how are you? That's what's very near and dear to me at the moment. (laughs) Well, I'm doing great, especially after reuniting with our friend Greg Overacker, our friend and private investigator and now author, Greg Overacker. He wrote a book called The Hunt for Brianna Maitland, The Relentless Pursuit of Answers to One of Vermont's Biggest Mysteries. And you can get it now. It is available on Bloated Toe Publishing's website. It's bloatedtoe.com. There's a link in the show notes. And this fantastic book that Greg wrote is about his bounty hunting career, but mostly about the disappearance of Brianna Maitland. And Greg has been working with Bruce, Brianna's father, on this case for over a decade now. And Lance, we joined the team in 2016 or 2017. Greg was in one of the very first episodes of Crawl Space. And we even have a mini series called Missing Brianna Maitland that you can search for if uh, you are looking for all of the information that we've produced on Brianna's case. And that includes a lot of interviews with Greg. And for those of you who don't know about Brianna Maitland's disappearance, you really should pick up Greg's book because at this point it is the definitive book that details all of the circumstances surrounding Brianna before, during, after the time of her disappearance. And you really get to know Greg as a person, as an investigator, and more than that, you get to know Bruce Maitland a little bit better as someone who wants his daughter found, but also somebody who wants to take that and help other people with it. And he has started, as most people know, because we talk about it all the time, Private Investigations for the Missing. Check out what they do at investigationsforthemissing.org. Tim and I are on the board of that nonprofit, which provides investigative services to families who have missing loved ones. And they provide those services at no cost, except the nonprofit pays for the expenses of the private investigator. So it's a really good cause that Bruce really needed at the time when Brianna went missing and was fortunate enough to have Greg contact him out of the blue and offer to work on his daughter's disappearance at no cost to himself. So it's all kind of inspired by and coming from Brianna's disappearance out of necessity. And like you said, Greg's been with us forever. He's been with us since almost the beginning, and we really couldn't be more grateful to be a part of this community. And of course, Brianna Maitland went missing on March 19th, 2004 from Montgomery, Vermont. And there's a link in the show notes if you'd like to submit an anonymous tip. Or you can call the Vermont State Police at 802-524-5993. And so this interview is going to be broken up into two parts. Part one is airing today, and part two will air next on this same feed. And we're going to take a quick break right now for a commercial and be right back with author Greg Overacker. Welcome back to the podcast. It's Greg Overacker. How the heck are you today? Wait, hold on. Let me say something different. Author Greg Overacker. How's it going today? Good. How are you guys? Yeah, doing great. Uh, Right. So we've added author to the list of your credentials. That's on your official resume or CV, as they call it uh, in some regions. Uh, So something to be proud of there. And your first book is an account of Brianna Maitland's disappearance. So I think that's important to note that that's what you took on for your first writing, your first uh, piece of writing. And we we have signed copies over here. Actually, is this signed? Did you sign this? You did. Okay, there it is. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> but um, before we get into that, this is a, a, a reunion of sorts. Tim actually said at the beginning before we started recording that it feels like a reunion. We hadn't spoken for a while. We briefly saw each other. Well, not briefly, but we saw each other uh, last week at the 5K uh, run walk for the missing uh, that was to support private investigations for the missing. You and some family members showed up and you participated. You ran and you won. You won the gold. No, no, I didn't run. I walked very slowly. <laughs> you walked. You, I, I didn't take it as you were walking slowly. I took it as you were following everybody to make sure we were safe. That's right. Yeah. That was a lot of fun. That was so a lot big, of fun. Just wanted to thank you uh, for that. I think uh, those appearances 
you don't hear too often on with these nonprofits that are very small and our team is small at PIs for the Missing. Uh, and when we have events, anytime somebody from the organization can put a face to it, who's directly involved, like you are a licensed private investigator who works for private investigations for the missing, you showing up like spoke volume. So big yeah. thanks on, on the entire board's behalf. Thanks. It was fun. It was fun. We had a perfect day too. Right. Yeah. Oh, and not to mention that was Brianna's birthday. Yeah. And it was absolutely perfect weather. Like Saturday yeah. before was awful. And that Sunday cleared up and it was beautiful. Beautiful, but a little windy. I was a little concerned on the way I drove out. I was a little worried. Did, uh, did you get to meet my friend Tommy that came out? Briefly. There was, Briefly. A, there was a lot going on there. Yeah. My sister came, a friend of ours. A friend of ours, actually, when my sister was a kid, when she was 18, she moved out there with a bunch of girls from my hometown. And a lot of them stayed. So she's been there forever, too. And uh, Tommy Silveria and his girlfriend Amber came. They're from Braintree. But he follows Brianna's case and stuff a lot. So it was fun. We had a good time. Yeah. Shout out to uh, to Tommy and uh, and company. Well, let's talk about you and this book, uh, Greg. And I want to start from the beginning in case folks haven't heard you on these shows before. So can you tell us a little bit about you, how you started looking into Brianna's case? So I saw a poster for Brianna on the thruway in 2006 on Father's Day. I was with my daughter, and we were coming back from Albany, my brother's house. My family was all there. I told my daughter to commit it to memory, and she did that information, and I contacted the Maitlands through Class Kids. Class Kids is an organization that looks for missing people, uh, assists families of missing people. It was started by uh, Mark Kloss, whose daughter Polly was abducted and murdered in Petaluma, California in, I think, 1993. They went out there and set up a, a professional search for the Maitlands. But through them, I contacted the Maitlands and um, met with them in Governor, New York, where they were living at the time. They had moved just outside Vermont's news coverage area so that they could have some normalcy in their life. And uh, and that way they could still return and do searches and, and, and you know, do interviews and talk to the police and stuff like that. So that's how I started working for them. And they were, at the time, they were really disenchanted with any help that they were getting. And you know, Bruce was pretty angry at the time. And, and you know, it was, a, it was a hugely demoralizing effort to try to get anything going. I mean, every effort failed. So that's kind of how I came on board in 2006. It's so interesting because I had, I've had i got the book in front of me and I just opened it when you were talking about it. And I happened to open it on page 76 where Bruce has a quote about you. And he said, we really don't have the money to hire anyone. And if Greg hadn't have called us out of the blue, I'm not sure we would have found anybody. Yeah. Which is really remarkable to me. And the chance encounter with the information that you saw when you were driving Right, though it was on a it was on a billboard or was it a poster? It was on a throughway. It was at no, it was inside by the bathrooms. The weird thing is, is that they had been approached, and it, and after I got involved too, we would get approached a lot by PIs and people like that, and they just didn't. And that's kind of in the book. They just didn't understand the gravity of it. They just thought, well, I'm going to come in and solve this. Just tell me what it is, I'll solve it, and stuff like that. And as soon as they found out that there was an emotional and time, commitment, and everything, they would just leave. They just thought they were going to come in and solve it and walk away and be the hero and all this other stuff. And it's, it's just nonsense. Lou Berry was the only one that ever walked in with realistic expectations and made a commitment. I'm curious what it was about the poster that made you want to commit it to memory and take the time to consider reaching out directly that stood out as far as like other missing persons posters that you'd probably seen in the past. You know, I, I don't know. and it, It's a really weird thing because all these years, it's always felt like something I'm supposed to be doing. I can't explain it. I don't believe in, you know me, you guys know me. I don't believe in anything to do with superstition or... But the spirits, they're all around you, Greg. You can literally see them. None of that. I don't believe in that even a little bit. But it always felt like something I was supposed to be doing. And I don't know, understand what that is. But I believe, I believe that everyone should have a dragon to slay. I believe that everybody should get up in the morning and have something that they're going after. I took a break in, I think, 2011, but I always felt like I had to come back into the fold. I mean, I always stayed in touch with Bruce, but uh, yeah. So I don't know what drew me to it so much, but I, I was. 
I like that. Everyone should have a dragon to slay. I think that's a, that's a cool line. Um, what makes you uniquely qualified to investigate a missing persons case? So, you know, I don't know. <laughs> uh, prior to this, so in my 20s, I started bounty hunting. And in, in the state of New York, you know, it wasn't something like uh, there were bail bond offices on every corner. So I gravitated to other states where that was the case. So what I would do is I would advertise nationwide and I would get like a one to 4% return on my advertisements. And back then that was old school. Or I would send away for phone books from major cities, you know, Patterson, New Jersey, Newark, New Jersey, stuff like that. And I would go through and literally send every bail bond company an ad with a, a plastic Rolodex card. Remember Rolodexes? So I would travel to those states or work would derive out of those states. So a lot of times states down south would call me and say, I need somebody picked up up in the northeast and brought back to me. That's kind of how that business functions. They don't want to come up here looking for somebody. They'll send you if unless they have to. So I would travel to these places all the time. And then when I'm down there, you know, I would get work down there. So I would stay down there and stuff like that. And I met a PI that I eventually went to work for and became a mentor in New Jersey, Scott Churchill. That's kind of in the book too, briefly. My publisher wanted me to go into all that. And he wanted me to basically write half a book on that. And I didn't want to take away from Brianna's story, which is why by design, my chapter is small. I just didn't want to distract from all that stuff. But anyway, at some point, I just realized I don't want to be doing this all the time for a couple of reasons. It's, it's violent, can be violent work, but it's also just time away. Nobody wants to be, <laughs> first of all, no one wants to get into a relationship with someone that's like, well, I'm leaving for work. When are you going to be back? I have no idea. Could be two days, could be two weeks. Nobody wants to do that. It was adventurous and everything, but it gets old. And it being in hotel rooms, away from home, eating shitty food and, you know, it, it can be exhausting in that way. And I think if I was based in a metropolitan area, you know, if I lived in Los Angeles or something, I could, you could do that full time and function around your city or nearby and farm other work out. But I, I couldn't do that. I, I had to travel. So I decided to do, to try to do other things. I actually started other businesses here back home and then gravitated into, into this. And, you know, when I took Brianna's case on and started doing that, realizing how much work it is and, and how involved it is, I didn't want to get involved in other stuff. So I just said, you know what? I'm not doing anything else. I'll just focus on Brianna. What skill set did you develop during your time bounty hunting that gave you an edge over an investigator who didn't have that background? You know, I don't know. I, it's, it's a, I think it's an experience thing, but it's, it's hard to explain how experience allows you to, to kind of see further into stuff. And it's funny that like working with Lou, who's been law enforcement for 35 years is that I can recognize that in him when I see it, when he starts to describe something or explain something to me and I listen to him, it's, you can see the experience and it's, you, you learn to see the nuance and stuff. It's kind of a lot like watching people discuss politics. Now, many, many people see things in black and white and to explain to them, look, the topic that you're discussing is very large and uh, there's a big, huge gray area in there. It's a massive discussion. It's not one thing as opposed to another. So I think that's kind of part of it. And, you know, you got to be willing to do certain things too. I mean, I think to the casual observer, it, people don't realize how much time like I've spent in Vermont. It's, it's a lot of time away from home and it's, you know, to go somewhere a couple states away, and I literally know people up there. And I literally will see people in public that know me. I mean, it's a weird thing. I have friends there now. I was in Burlington two weekends ago. I was in both up uh, northern Vermont and northern New Hampshire three weeks ago. It's it's hard to explain, but you kind of have to just immerse yourself. And it it made sense, regardless of whether. You think it made sense. It definitely, <laughs> it definitely made sense. Okay. Um, there's a large part of your book that's dedicated to the timeline, and and that's important. And without getting into like the details of the timeline, because I, I know I'm kind of jumping ahead as far as details of Brianna's disappearance, but I just want to take the idea of a timeline and how an investigator approaches mapping out 
a timeline of a potential crime in a way where people can read it and understand it and not get overwhelmed by it. Because details in your timeline, obviously, each one has a whole story behind it. How do you truncate each one of those bullet points that occurred on a certain date? So that was a, a, a weird thing because you'll notice I elaborated. So I tell people this when they when they get the book. I, if I talk to them before they read it, I tell them this. Don't jump ahead because the book seasons you for the end. And if you read the end before you read the book, it, it's not the same thing. So you have to read the whole book. So then you get to the timeline part and there's stuff in the timeline that you know from reading the book. Obviously, because I'm referring back. I didn't know how much to put in there, how much to elaborate on stuff. Because people want to hear A, B, and C happened. Well, each one I tried to just give a little notato. Okay, this person was involved. Remember remember this person because this, that, and the other thing. Because the story does get a little a little involved, doesn't it? So I don't know if that's answering your question. But, you know, the funny thing is, is 90% of that book was written, I, I was in bed. Because I would come home at, I would come home at night and grab my laptop after I was done with everything, eating and showering and stuff, open my laptop and sit in bed and just type and put 90% of it together that way. And I had paperwork strewn everywhere because I have tons of paperwork, court documents and stuff from Brianna's case. You know, that's the other thing I tell people is there's so it's heavy reading because there's so many facts. It's places, it's people, it's times, it's conversations, it's what took place and dispelling rumors and all that other stuff. But when for everybody that wants to know about Brianna's case, that's the facts. That's all the facts you're going to get. I want to get into the specifics in a moment, but uh, I'm just curious, why did you decide to write a book? So during the pandemic, I was extremely isolated. I, didn't, I don't have any family here and stuff. So I just sat home and had, well, I got a project to do. It's the dragon to slay. I'm going to write this book. So my brother's like, why don't you just do this? You've been talking about it. Do it. I had the time. I was home. Once I got into it, and it helps me because I see things in order, and I see all the facts laid out. So it helps me a lot to keep this stuff in my mind. Now I can recall these facts and, and know what happened as opposed to what. And people, you know, I get confused now. Lou will look into a tip we get or something, and he'll have all this information. And I'm not like him. I can't absorb it like he does. So he'll be naming names and stuff, and I'll keep questioning him. Who's that again? What's this? So that, that helps me to do this. It's therapeutic. Yeah, let, let's get into some specifics here. Can you tell us uh, what you know about Brianna and what was her life like before she went missing? When Bruce and I discussed this, he he wanted me to do it 100%. He said, I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't want anybody else to write a book about it because you see people put things into books that just shouldn't be in books, for starters. He gave me his blessing. When you look at their life prior, he didn't want a big chapter on, on their family. It's, it's intrusive. I mean, it's everyone's peeking in your windows all the time as it is kind of thing. So to give the basics about her life was fine. I mean, but it's that if you, if you, if you read that, nobody's ever mentioned it, but if you read the chapter about the Maitlands and it seems thin, it's that way by design, but it does give, I think all you need to know the way they lived, where they lived, what was going on in their life. When you look at it, you think, what a cool way to live. They have two homes, a mile-long driveway back into the woods to these two homes that is a 1,000 feet from the Canadian border. It's an outdoorsman's dream. You know, they're camping on their own property. They can hunt on their own property. They've they've got it set up kind of uh, back to the land, with solar power, water power, heating with wood, all this other stuff. Bruce is working in forestry. Uh, as a forester, but what he didn't realize, and, he, and this is talked about in the book, what he didn't realize was how isolated she felt. Kids want to run with kids kind of thing. Um, she wanted to be in town where she could be with the kids and stuff like that. And there's that opposition too in the way they live up there where you drive through Verm up Northern Vermont and you think what a wholesome looking place where there's, you know, it's it, the state is 76% forested and it's, really sparsely populated and you know what do you think of when you think of vermont leaf peeping and maple syrup and all this other stuff well there's a huge drug problem there's a lot of boredom brutal winters so she kind of moved into that 
being around, uh, unfortunately, being around some unsavory people and stuff. And, and so that's kind of talked about, too. Yeah, and unfortunately, you have to talk about the drug problem that was taking place at that time in the area and the related characters that come into play when you discuss the drug problem. Uh, what what was the drug problem? What drug was it? Where was it coming from? And can you give us some uh, some names of some of these people that brought or encouraged or escalated that problem? There was a crack cocaine epidemic going on at the time. And if you look back at the different drug problems that go through, of course, we got a really bad one now with uh, opioids, which is devastating the country. It came through and it was like a cancer in that area. It was being pumped up from like Springfield, Mass, and um, it would come up from New York City and it would go in. There's like a pipeline that came through Burlington and they'd move it farther north into St. Albans and stuff like that. And people were literally going there and just setting up camp to sell drugs. and. They, if you think about it, they were living the dream because they would go up to these areas and they were from really big metropolitan areas, but they would go up there and live in the country in these little small towns. They had money. They didn't have to work. You know, they were having a ball, just kind of taking over the place and, and making a ton of money. But they wreaked havoc and it, and it just was poison to everybody and destroyed families. And people are still having problems with that stuff today. But the two of the main characters that, you know, and I didn't go into these guys too much in the book, but uh, everybody knows their name that knows this case, the Ramon Ryans and Nathaniel Jackson. I mean, they were there among the, Brianna's friends. There were two guys from New York City who came up and that's what they did. Was they sold drugs. You know, they, they were part of that pipeline and they were part of the guys that came up and just did their thing and kind of destroyed and poisoned everybody. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors, and now we're back to the program. Okay, so tell us a bit about the circumstances of Brianna Maitland's disappearance. So Brianna was working March 19th, 2004 at the Black Lantern Inn in Montgomery. She left at 11.20 p.m., and her car was found two minutes down the road, literally a two-minute drive down the road, backed into an abandoned home, and uh, she was never seen again. So there were witnesses uh, to the car starting at midnight. There were witnesses that viewed the vehicle. It was prominently displayed on the side of the road. The next day at about 1 p.m., a state trooper came by and viewed the vehicle and had it towed. There were paychecks on her seat, and he he went up the road to the Black Lantern Inn, and it was closed. He was going to inquire about the car. He then went on a long weekend, and and, uh, her disappearance kind of went into limbo. So days went by before anyone was alerted. And then when her, she was staying at a friend's house at the time, she had, she had left home and was kind of going from house to house and staying with friends and stuff like that. She just didn't want to be up in the isolated up on their home up on uh, Boston post road. And so her friend eventually alerted the family that she hadn't come back to the house and they ended up going to the police department. It's all in a timeline in the book where, how that transpired and how the police eventually got involved. But a lot of time was wasted. A lot. You know what stood out to me in the book that wasn't directly written, but you can kind of put the pieces together in your own head, was that you said the car was prominently displayed, and it it was. I mean, it's the cover of your book as well. The car backed into the uh, Dutch burn house. It's such a small community. It's such a small town. Everybody knew everybody. And like you said, Brianna wanted to leave the isolated environment that she was in at her parents' house because she wanted to be around her friends and people of her own age and just more activity in town. Is there any way, like, why didn't the word spread faster about Brianna's car being backed into the Dutch burn house? Or did it? And it's just kind of not known. or or Because uh, that, that, that kind of confused me. It's like, even back then, if I had seen a friend's car backed into a house, I feel like there would have been a lot more chatter about, oh, did you see so-and-so's car? Like, what was that all about? But maybe there was. It was a strange thing. On March 19th, 1120, she goes, she leaves work. Around midnight, it starts where we have four witnesses. One of them was two people in a car together, boyfriend and girlfriend. One of them was a man who had a family member who lived in town. Uh, Another was a boy, and this this isn't anything new, I, I can say his name publicly, James Robitelli, who was 
she grew up with him, basically. She knew him. She dated him on and off in that small town kind of way. He actually viewed the vehicle, got out, walked up to it. It had its lights on. It's backed into this abandoned home. It's got its lights on. It's got a, a directional on. Both doors are open. He shuts the doors, turns off the lights, shuts the doors, and leaves. And, and you know, when questioned why he didn't call the police, he just said that, uh, you know, she wasn't there and he was intoxicated. And he said, I'm not going to call the police on myself. So he goes, I left, figuring she she got home or somebody got her out of there. And that's always been a weird situation in and of itself because he lied many times to the police about it, about what time he was there, where he was coming from, and all this other stuff. So that's an issue. But then in the morning, there's passersby that stop and take pictures, and that's pretty well documented in the book. Then prior to 1 p.m., I mean, they come by around 8.30, prior to 1 p.m., a slew of people have to, nobody's reported it to us, but they have to see the car. It's right there by the side of the road, and there's traffic there. Now, we've heard people in the comments say, oh, yeah, I saw the car that morning. Oh, yeah, I saw the car that morning. They just drove by it. Now, I'm with Lance on this, but, but Lou and I, Lou's got a different opinion. Now, Lou will tell you that as a police officer, they find abandoned vehicles all the time. It's a, it's not that uncommon. Cops see weird stuff. You don't realize that. You don't know what you don't know. But when you go out, I used to see the strangest shit bounty hunting. I mean, just weird stuff because you're intruding on people's lives and you're going into neighborhoods where people function differently than you do and stuff like that. But he just said it's not that uncommon. And, and to me, this wasn't an abandoned car on the side of the road where someone was drunk and walked home. This was an accident and it was a weird accident. It wasn't somebody drove off the road and ran into a tree. This is backed into a building to the point where it punched a hole in the building and it's on display on the side of the road in an air and, and there's nothing else around it's not like a deer distracted her and she stopped in the middle of the road and then backed up and hit a building off the it you know what i'm saying it doesn't make any sense it's not, it's not like a rabbit ran out in front of her and she careened off the road and went in a ditch so i get that and i agree with you that i think it's just bizarre after i got involved in this i was driving it up the road from my house. If you had one direction away from my house, it goes up into the country. And there was a car parked on the side of the road. Nobody pulls over on the side of the road here. And I called the police and I it was to explain it to him. And he acted like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you wanted nothing to do with it. And I said, listen, I'm coming back here in 20 minutes. And if you haven't been here, I'm going to have a problem. Because I'm thinking somebody f came here and left their car and went and broke in a house nearby. I'm thinking they're cutting through a backyard and going to break into somebody's house or something. Or why? Why is this car here? There's no reason. There's no earthly reason for it to be here. You know what I mean? Or even more important, if it's there in 20 minutes, it's even worse because it could have been somebody who just like went into the into the tree line and, and you know, went to the bathroom or something needed to take, you know, take a quick minute for themselves. But if you go back there in 20 minutes, yeah. then there you're right. There was a problem. What are you doing there? <laughs> you know what? I don't have I'm I'm really pro police, I, but police are human beings. Twice when I was out working. I've caught police sleeping in their cars. In the, my neighboring town, I pulled up to a cop car to tell him something one night, and he was sleeping in the car. I went over and knocked on the window. Wake up! <laughs> you know? I think you're on shift. You're sitting in a cruiser. You know? So I, I get a little irritated, but... That's understandable. But tell us a little bit about the Dutch burn uh, house. So this was, wasn't was an occupied house at the time of, uh, of the crash. No. So the Dutch burn house where the car was backed into, two men lived there. Last name was Dutch burn. It's all farm field. There's a picture in the book where you can see there's nothing around it. It's just on the side of the road and there's big fields around it and then woods off in the distance. Um, and it's on a kind of a gradual bend. They were elderly men who had a dairy farm and spent their whole life right there in that area. I think I think they Chloe wrote an article that I put in the book just to give people an idea of of, of the the home. She wrote a really good article about it. Kind of explains everything. I think they had left town once to go visit somebody or something, but they just worked you know twelve fourteen hour days or something every day of their life in that barn. I think they even said one of them was all hunched over from being hunched over in the barn and everything. But they had had a home invasion. Somebody locally knew that they carried cash on them. Those guys, they had thousands of dollars, put them in their overall pocket and walked around with it all day long. They got hurt during the home invasion. Uh, they returned home for a short time, but then they went into nursing homes and they eventually passed away. And the home sat vacant ever since. So the home kind of had that aura of 
a tragedy to begin with. And this was kind of, and Lance brought this up years ago in a podcast when we were talking about now, how odd is it that there's another tragedy there? Yeah. And I know something that comes up um, often when talking about Brianna's case is uh, that area and that, I guess, I guess it was kind of like a parking lot that was next to the Dutch burn house. Was that a meetup spot for kids? I I know a lot of people uh, talk about that. Was that a common area for people to stop and maybe have a smoke or something like that? No, you know, that was a big thing we asked everybody. So it wasn't really a parking area, but what it was, was like, if you pulled off the side of the road, there was like a gradual, you know, it was kind of where they parked when they, when they lived there, where you could just pull off the side of the road and onto a gradual flat piece of land right in front of their house. But that's it. No, nobody stopped there. Nobody go there to would go there to party or anything like that. Which is funny because, and and that's another thing that I guess uh, when people look at the case or they read articles about it and stuff, people always say, "Well, did they search that house? Did they search that house?" They did, but no one's going to go in that house. It's just an, it's just a shell of a home. Actually, it's it's old and weathered and fuck, you know, windows boarded up. The uh, area though is like you said, the house itself is sort of sitting there in the middle of an open space uh, and it's not there today. So if anybody's listening and they want to go explore it, it's not there today. There's like some remnants of foundation, but it, it is on like one of the main roads though, that, that goes like through town, correct? Yeah. So, you know, when you're in that area and because it's sparsely populated, there's, it's common area to travel into Montgomery that way, which Montgomery is very small. So you're just kind of dr- driving through this little town, you know, kind of like a hamlet. All right, tell us a little bit more about James. Uh, so I know James and Brianna kind of had a relationship. What's the story with him coming by the car that night? I think that fact kind of, uh, I don't know, confuses some people, me included. So it's, a, it's, you know, James passed away in a car accident, unfortunately. So Brianna was friends with him and his sister and um, dated James, James on and off. And uh, you know, part of part I think too it gets lost when people read about this, and, and you know the deal. People really get involved in this case. They really gravitate to it and read everything they can read on it, and, and all this other stuff. And it gets confusing. But one thing that really gets lost is that Brianna was a hundred pound, seventeen year old kid. People start to view her as a woman, and she wasn't. She was a an immature seventeen year old kid. Um, but anyway, James and her had this. Uh, on and again, off again relationship at times, but they were friends. And, you know, when Brianna was traveling around and staying at people's houses in town and stuff like that, she actually stayed at uh, James and uh, his sister Hillary's grandparents' house. So people took her in and kind of looked after her and stuff like that. And that was a way of monitoring her too, um, which kind of changed over time. But the weird thing about James was that, of course, of what happened with the car, the fact that he was there, he touched it. He lied to police about, you know, being there at certain times and doing certain stuff. It became very questionable and everybody wonders if he was involved and, you know, and I don't blame him, but um, we don't have any evidence of anything, him doing anything wrong, but it's, it's certainly sparks everyone's interest and stuff, you know, and he was at the fight too. I forget how many days it was, 22 or something days prior to her going missing. She was in a fight and um, he was there with her that night. Part two coming up in a few days. Check out the link in the show notes to purchase a copy of Greg's book.